as many fan sites have voted Owen Farrell as the best 12 in the world, um, Finn Russell should be the fly half for the Lions. <laughs> and for those that are not watching this on YouTube, Harry's just put his head in his hands. Hello, and in the week that Leicester have a spending spree, Scott the Man Steele joins Quinns. Saracens will play the Stormers next year, and we edge closer to a trans Tasman comp. But what about South Africa? And welcome to the Ruck and Wall podcast. This week, I'm joined by Joan Harry. How are you doing, lads? That's all right. Very good, thank you. Yeah, you Hello, back in a, still in the Premier League. Good lad. Good lad. Hey. Great, great to see. Um, got, I'm rocking the Crusaders shirt this week. Still with the faith of the boys after not having a uh, particularly good um, weekend. But on this episode, we look at, as I said, the streak is over and Goodhue breaks the Chiefs' hearts. Uh, and over in Super Rugby AU, Corin Betty stars as the Rebels ease past the Tars and the Brumbies batter the force. Uh, we'll also go through our players of the week and discuss the halfbacks in our Lions 15. But I just wanted to start with a little thing in England and, and in the Premiership. And as, as I alluded to in the little um, title st- st- sequence at the beginning, that Leicester have made six signings this week. So Guy Porter from the Brumbies, Luke Wallace has come out from the championship after being sort of in no man's land the last few years after leaving Quinns, uh, the back rower. Uh, Kinney Mirimuivalu, um, the La Rochelle 15, who's been really, really good for them the last four or five seasons, is moving across. Matthias Moroni, the Hagawara in uh, 12, is coming across. Um, and then Jasper Vence uh, from the Cheetahs, um, has also joined on, joined on Friday. And then notably, as we talked about on Friday's podcast, Kobesh Van Vyck has also come in. Um, they join, obviously, Nondolo, Jordan Tawafun has re-signed, plus Matt Scott and Shavili, uh, Mama, Mamakashvili, of also notable sign that the Tigers have made uh, for the restart. They've lost, obviously, Great Bateman, Noel Reed, Johnny May, Carl Eastman, Teresa Vianu, Manu Tualangi is the most notable, and others as well. But have Leicester made strides to push themselves up the table with these signings or is this them just papering over the cracks? I think you would never, you'd much rather keep the squad that they had than have these, have these big changes. But if you were going to lose, really the, the big two are May and Tuolangi. If you were going to lose those two to replace them with Nadolo and sort of the collection of the other outside backs that they've brought in, um, you could do a hell, a hell of a lot worse. Obviously, the age profile is not ideal of most of these signings. They're all getting towards their late 20s, early 30s, mid-30s in Nadolo's case. Um, but I think given the situation that they were in, you could have been quite worried, but they've dealt with it very well. Yeah, I think so. It's it's tough. Leicester haven't had a, a very good few years. And um, for those sorts of players, with Tuolangi and Johnny May, yes, they play great for Tigers, but they actually don't get that much game time generally. And they haven't had that great uh, players of, of a particular standard below them, the likes of Noel Reed and um, Adam Thompson and a few others. So with these players coming in, yes, they're a bit older and, and they're international. There's a high likelihood that they'll play throughout more of the season than those players did. So that's a, certainly a positive. But I think really their issue hasn't really been the backs particularly in years gone by. They've had some players like Ben Young's, uh, George Ford. Um, they've always had quite a decent backline, but they've struggled recently in their, in their forward pack. And I'm not sure whether they've really done too much to to solidify that at all. They haven't really improved upon that, in my opinion. I, I completely agree with you. As you say, like they basically, re, obviously they lost a hell of a lot of backs and they've had to replace that. And obviously we talked on Friday, like Van Veek is a really good pickup. Like one of the, one of the underrated signings of the season that's going to go under a lot of people's tables. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. My dad turned to me the other day and was like, Leicester have signed this bloke. Who is he? And I was like, he's actually pretty good. Gave mm. him the stats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, they've gone high. They've gone big name profiles in the... Um, in the backs, obviously, um, Muru, Muri Muravalo is a very good pickup as well for them. But they needed like an X factor um, forward to sign. And obviously, the brilliant thing they've signed is Jordan Taufu has re-signed. Like he was fantastic for them, by far their best forward. Obviously, they lost Guy Thompson to Ealing. Like that's a player they probably should have kept. Like he's been really, really good for them. 
um, in a team they fought, but they did need like they needed a big guy. They need um, they needed like an X factor profile sign. And I think like Luke Wallace, brilliant. He was brilliant for Quinns, and he's been good for commentary in the championship. But again, if you talk about age factor, he's at thirty now. Like they needed a really big, high profile guy. Um, and I think with Matthias Moroni is a good sign as well from the Hague Warriors. He's been solid for them, but he's not Manu Tuolangi. Or yeah, Manu no, like completely agree. I think I think Leicester are they're almost missing a trick in they must have that club must have some serious connections with certainly rugby and Samoa and now with Nadolo um, and a couple of the other Fijians coming in. They must have some good connections and a good understanding of, the, of some players that are some forwards that are playing in the Pacific Islands who have yet to be discovered. One of the things that um, Glasgow have done really, really well in the last sort of five, ten years is finding players like Nakaroa and Bill Matter who just make a huge difference. They can't be on an enormous amount of salary because they've basically just been discovered. Um, and they can immediately be the difference between winning and losing matches. And Leicester haven't really had any discovery signings in that sense. They're signing good older players, but they're not they're not breaking anyone's expectations in terms of the players that they're signing, which really can be the difference and would be the difference if they could. Yeah, I think yeah, definitely right. One of the big things for me that I'm taking from a lot of this is that it doesn't look good for their longevity. One of the things that Tigers really need to be doing is building that squad for the future because they've had the players, you know, the likes of Tulangi have been there a very long time and have, have been a service to the club, but they haven't got many of those players coming through now. And with all of these players being not only at the lesser stages of their career, but internationals that typically, yeah, that, especially at that age, don't stick around very long, um, I think they're going to struggle in the next few years to come. Yeah, it's one of those things where, as I say, the... As a, if not, we're not, we're not, none of us are Leicester fans, but I think if you were a Leicester fan, you can look on these signs and go, they are progress because generally, they're, apart from maybe Irish, they've been the two worst teams at recruiting players in the last four years. Like Some of their signs have generally been like, why have you signed this player? Like um, Guy Porters and obviously Harry Potter are an interesting two signings. I just wanted to finish up with two young guys, 23 from the Brumbies and the... Rebels, respectively. Obviously, they're not starting for them at all. Um, I mean, we'll talk about Tom Wright later on. If you're looking for a winger to buy from the Brumbies, you don't buy. You, you should be looking at him as opposed to um, Guy Port. But they've got the guy who was at Sydney University, the head coach. They're bringing these guys over. But it's kind of a shame they're bringing these two Australian young lads over that are going to take up a, maybe a wage for a long, young English winger. Like, that's slightly over stuff. But, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's strange, I think, really, in that regard. I would just be, we should probably wrap up briefly on left, uh, Leicester, but just to briefly mention that both of those two uh, guys they've signed from Australia, they are English qualified, um, which is both good for them in terms of salary. And they're that kind of profile of player that won't have been or would have been struggling to get a professional contract in Australia. And even if they did, it would be really, really cut. Some of the, these guys in Australia are playing on hugely reduced salaries. I think some even down to 40% of what they were before. Um, so I think it was a really great time to find some good young Australian talent, which hopefully they have done. Yeah, uh, I didn't actually know that about the, um, the English qualified thing, so that's quite interesting. As they are, they are exciting players, but yeah, that's that's interesting to start on that. Um, as I say, we're going to do a f- full preview podcast dedicated to the Premiership when it returns us, um, and then we'll be posting some stuff on our social media about how potential 15s are going to look as as they've obviously now we've passed the July deadline. These new players. Um, for example, Johnny May got moving to Gloucester can now play for them, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, let's pop down to the actual rugby then. So then we'll pop that over to New Zealand and the Crusaders a four year home streak winning record is over as the Hurricanes have come along and broken it. Um, what it 34, 32 in the end. And what it shows is the Hurricanes putting a lot of pressure on the Crusaders, forcing errors, forcing penalties. And they hung on the end. Jordy Barrett with that key turnover took a little punch in the face from Quinton Strange um, at the end, which was the most stupidest yellow card. Like, just get it, just end the game, to be honest. But yeah, thoughts on the Hurricanes, lads? They're four from four. They're still really good, but well, rather the, the Crusaders are still really good, but the Hurricanes 
the Hurricanes were better. There were some good performances for the Hurricanes, but I think also kind of quite un- 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 uncharacteristically quiet performances from a few of the Crusaders. So like Goodyear didn't have a, an amazing game. He got done a few times, um, had a few good um, offloads as well, but didn't defend particularly well. George Bridge, apart from his try, didn't do a huge amount. Well, Jordan didn't do a huge amount. So there was a few in there that were fairly quiet. And on the other end, there are a few Hurricanes players that were putting their hands up. Like Peter Umana Jensen was quality. I was really, really impressed with him. Every time he, t- he got the ball, he was taking such hard lines that he was he was uh, breaking tackles and making meters every single time. So shame he got he got injured towards the end, but he was one of the real catalysts for the Hurricanes. Yeah, he. I think for me, he was definitely the man of the match. By yeah. there were some brilliant sun out performances, like Karifi yeah. really putting his hand up when the Blues were obviously moving Papali to at six, which meant Papali had a slightly quieter game than he has had. He's really putting his hand up and going, "Come on, I'm I'm here to be picked." So he was brilliant. But on among the Jensen, just absolutely fantastic. Like where's Goosen's first try? It's great hands down the line. He's run a brilliant support line. They've gone wide, and Goosen's got a walk over again. Second try, Karifi's got a great offload in. Um, and Goosen scored again. So we talked about on fr- uh, Friday that he's not going to have the impact, but it kind of makes my point a bit more that maybe Van Bike's not going to be in there. But obviously now Ben Lamb has moved on. He's moved. He's going to Bordeaux. And just on that, um, I don't know if you've seen, but Julian Sarvet looks like he's coming into the Hurricanes with a cryptic tweet from Ardy Sarvet, mm. um, which could be very yeah. exciting to replace Pat, uh, Ben Lamb. I do know that... Um... Uh, Surveyor has been has been at all of these all of the Hurricanes matches has been supporting the team and I assume training, um, so I, I guess it was only a matter of time before they before they gave him a run out. Um, so that'll be that'll be exciting to see see how much of that 2016-17 uh, team they can rebuild, um, given that Jordy Barrett's now back fit. Um, just looking at the some of the match stats and some of the player stats. Um, it's really, really rare that the possession in a rugby match is anything other than 50% each, 51%, 49 It's very, very rare that it's anything other than that just by the way of the structure of the game. The Crusaders had 56% of the possession in this match and the in individual player stats are hugely weighted towards the Crusaders. The They had Moonga, Reese, and Jordan both with over 90% carried meters uh, all three of them rather over 90 carry meters none of the hurricanes had more than 50 carry meters the tackles made and missed more importantly the hurricanes made 134 missed 41 tackles so they missed a quarter of the tackles that they made over a quarter of the tackles that were made um the crusaders only needed to make 91 and missed 19 Crusaders played almost all, really, what would have looked like all of the rugby in this match and were no, really no less fantastic than they normally are. But the few opportunities that they gave the Hurricanes, they pounced on and scored, which that is, happens very, very rarely in a rugby match. But the Hurricanes did really, really well to score whenever they could. And I, and I think that is epitomised by among the Jensen's try. I like... As I said, they got they got out of, kind of out of nowhere. Really, they got a penalty. They kicked it long. They went through the phases, and then it's a it's actually Vince Arso who's come off the bench, who's not maybe had the best Super Rugby R tier rower. Just he's pulled. He, it's really nice that he just kind of instead of going up the middle, he's pulled out, goes a bit wide, sort of crabs along. He's seen Joe Moody's out of position, misses the tackle. Then Pye's got to come in. He then gets sucked in, and then Bermunga Jensen though, what that's an incredible finish. He's not a particularly big lad where. They've got Lau Mape, who can, can smash a barn door down. He's still a relatively young guy. He's still developing. But the fact that he's beaten Goodhue, Pyre, and I think it was Bridge to go through them, it's a phenomenal finish. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. You've just got to look at the, the attacking lines they're running. It's all down to whoever's sorting out that back line. And the attacking coach has got a lot of, uh, should take a lot of credit for, for the Canes win because the, that's where all their tries are happening. They look so dangerous whenever they've got the ball. And it's down to the likes of Long and Jensen running such hard cutting lines that he, he's breaking breaking the, the, the tackles every single time. And if he isn't, if he doesn't get the ball, then he's holding defenders. And that seems to be where they're, where they're being successful. And then obviously Houston 
had a few like, played all right, didn't really do very much, but he he was able to be put in for a few tries just because there's they've isolated all the defenders inside him. Yeah, it's, as I say, it was a, it all round like the Hurricanes are building up to this performance, and they came out uh, all guns blazing. They took it to him. It's like very similar. To, they did a very similar tactic to the, what the Blues did when the Blues came out firing, and they the Crusaders absorbed, absorbed, absorbed. But the main difference was that the Crusaders didn't have that um, uh, that moment where actually we kind of went, oh God, we need to kind of get ourselves in front here. And they maybe left it a little bit too late for that moment to happen. And it was actually the Mwanga um, line where he just kind of goes, fuck it, throws an absolutely incredible dummy, glides his way through, and then throws that pass. And then Reese goes in. It's it's They're sort of back in it with uh, seven minutes to go. But they've got some so some absolutely brilliance again, like George Bridge potentially up there for try of the tournament. Like they've got they've broken through again. It's a beautiful pass by Sebu Reese. He's chucked it 35 meters, and it's just bat like that. Many people might say it's bounced off his foot, but he's clearly went to do it. Jordy Barrett had fell asleep there, bless him. He was at a quality game, and he's had an off. He's had a bit of a he, he fell asleep there um, to yeah. let him in there. But yeah, off day for the Crusaders, but um, they've still got two bonus points. The gap's three points over the Blues now. So, with a game in hand, I wouldn't want to be the Chiefs next week. Let's put it that way, because Scott Robinson will have had them fired up. They'll they'll come back and pretty strong. Anyone else on that, or well, should I move it on? I'll, I'll just go quickly. Um, yeah, Jordy Barrett, a great game. Fell asleep briefly in that moment, but I've got another bit of a bone to pick with him. This isn't the first time he's done this, and I've seen this a couple of times with different Kiwi teams. I can't, I can't think of like any reason why you do this. Maybe one of you two might have a different perspective to me, but we do this a lot in in um, rugby in in England, and you see it a lot in the Premiership. If you're up uh, within like the last ten minutes, certainly within the last five minutes, you hold onto the ball, you you run down the clock, you just do anything but give it back to the opposition. And now this is not, this is at least the second time I've seen Jory Barrett do it this this um, this competition. Can't have been more than six minutes left on the clock, and he kicks it straight back to them, and they go and score. And it just so happens that they missed the conversion, and they still happen to win. But why would you even give them that opportunity? Like, just hold on to it. It's, it's especially for as they've been playing so well all, all game. Clearly, to have been up against the Crusaders, what you've got to do is hold on to it for a few minutes. Why would you? Why would you even think about giving it back to them? Yeah. It- it is a seemingly thing and it's a trend also in the weekend where, and in the next game, which we'll move on to is the Blues did the same thing where they gave the Chiefs mm. the opportunity to get right back in the game at, at the end. And did you want to say a point on um, the, the, that Hurricanes game or we'll move on to the Blues, Harry? I was just going to briefly follow up. Um, I was uh, just checking to see if we'd heard anything about Lamape's injury. Um, and unfortunately he no. tweeted about half an hour ago uh, that that's, um, the end of his Aotearoa competition, but he should be back for the rest of, or at some point uh, later in 2020. So I expect he's hoping to be back for the All Black tests when and if they ever happen. Um, so I think we were we were suspecting a broken wrist or a broken arm um, yeah. making impact with the with the Crusaders. Was it Moody's hip or his elbow? Sort of I think it was hip, or something like that. In the mo- in the motion of doing of the tackle. Um, which is also a bit worrying given that how frequently some of these guys who get forearm injuries, how often they recur. Mm. Um, so fingers crossed that he deals with it, lets it recover as well as he possibly can. Um, and then that it never happens again. Um, Cause he's a fantastic player, had another good game and or was having another good game until that moment. Yeah. Hopefully he can, um, he'll get, get stronger and come back. Cause he, he was brilliant. He was one of the, he was pr- the, probably the informed 12, and kind of putting a lot of doubters that he has in New Zealand about him being the new All Black 12 is by far the, the he's a head and shoulders above the rest at the moment in there. As I say, just on another injury, sort of link it into the next game is I uh, hope Alamano is also, um, I don't know about him, but he came off, looked like he'd um, either dislocated his shoulder or his collarbone or something. Poor, um, he's, he's a scored, he's scored the key, tried to get him back in the game. And Caleb Clark's, to be fair, it's, I don't think Caleb Clark's deliberately done it. He's, tried to stop him and pull him into touch and he's yeah but it's he's landed on top of him it's a, it's a shame I do certainly more on the Alain Marlo thing um, and I think it happened again in, a, in another try scoring moment this weekend there are very very many situations where the 
someone is in the act of scoring a try, it's very clear that he's going to score the try. And the defender just leaves something on him, like looking like he's going to try and stop the try. I don't think that was the case with Clark in this situation. Um, but it's almost quite surprising that more people don't get injured in the act of scoring tries. It, we're quite lucky that they don't, given that it's such a vulnerable position. People are steaming in at full speed. Um, so I suspect that I suspect there'll be some law change to look after that people in that position. But yeah, hopefully Alamalo's all right. Yeah, shame because he was looking pretty promising for the Chiefs. Um, but on that, as I say, the uh, the game of, the, um, of today was Blues versus the Chiefs and Eden Park. Uh, Blues taking it in the end, 21-17. Kind of got that prediction right on Friday, lads, that the Blues weren't going to score the bonus point. Back and sort of back and forth game, it was evenly matched. Um, the Blues defence really got them out of trouble. Some really key turnovers where the Chiefs looking to go wide and score and they got some key turnovers. And then there's nothing... Um, symbolise more than and Josh Goodhue um, with that turnover on the at the end. It's an unreal turnover. But I'm looking at the TV and I, like they've got they've it's um, who's gone to the bin for the Blues? I can't remember. Duffy's gone to the no plumber. Plumber went to the bin, and I'm like, just take the scrum or take the line out. The line out is in there. The scrum's the best option in that situation because you've lost a back player, which means they're gonna have the overlap. And they went for a tap and go. And then two phases after, it gets turned over. So, again, the Chiefs have got so close, but yet so far. But let's sort start on the Blues then. Anyone got any thoughts on them, really? Bowden Barrett, 10, key position? Yeah, no, it was good. Um, didn't, doesn't have the impact on the game. Has a quite different impact on the game um, than how we've seen him play at 10 uh, previously. I know when he moved into 10 towards the end of last week's match. He had that show and go moment um, to score the try and had a, was carrying a bit more himself. Um, I'm not really sure why maybe he's carrying something small or just isn't within the Blues game plan, but he doesn't carry an awful amount um, of his own accord. Maybe the defences are focusing on him. Um, but he's, he's very, very good at that distributing 10 role, even so good kicking, pretty accurate in this game, I think. So, yeah, no, looking good. Just on Bode Barrett quickly, as I say, like, he has that, I did make a note of it in the game, like, he's got that unique ability, I think, to glide through holes sometimes that appear. He's got that really good ability of, like, if you're a young player growing up, like, you need to get, especially if you're playing 10, you need to get your shoulders square, and he gets them literally as square as they can be, and that really helps him go for that hole. It's good to see him at 10, he was much better in there. Um, um, they'll probably continue with that for, for the for the rest of the rest of the season. Yeah, especially with Matt Duffy having a really good game. Mm, yeah, um, good. Lovely try, lovely finish. Yeah, not not expected. If I'm honest, no, I didn't know he had those wheels. Yeah. Um, very big guy. Uh, so I guess once he's got once he's got the momentum, he can he can really fly. But yeah, it was a really nice line. And I think we've not talked much about Rico Ioani. Um, in these more, most recent games when the Blues have been struggling. But that little no-look, mm. just keep the ball in motion, hop on to Duffy, knowing that he was coming through right at that moment. It was a really nice piece of skill. Um, Ioani's stat line doesn't look outrageous from this game. A couple of clean breaks, a couple of defenders beaten, but another game where he just has a very quietly, very, very effective presence. Um, I think he'll be happy with how he's playing. It's the little five, between five and ten metres he gets subtly, where it doesn't technically count as a defender beaten because yeah. they make the tackle, but the tackle's made way behind the gain line, but it's subtle, which means they can get pace on the ball. I thought it was brilliant. He had a superb game. Like an Another one to really pick out was probably Finley Christie in the nine shirt that we talked a lot about, Sam Nock. Christie was fantastic. And like we'll talk about that in team of the week later on, but he was the team player of the week in that role. Found absolutely brilliant, and he deserved his try. Um, the referee kind of didn't give it, but he's already walking all the way back to the halfway line, knowing he scored. They had to take it to the TMO, uh, but he is it. Uh, there was something a little bit in there that maybe they, he was a bit short, but the ball's on the line. Yeah, I can completely agree. Christie, not somebody who was, um, let's say, much loved at the Hurricanes. They weren't too disappointed to see him leave and a lot of 
similar to quite a few of the um, guys that have come from the Hurricanes to the Blues, other than Barrett. Um, the Blues were a little concerned, or Blues fans at least, were a little concerned about how much how much he'd actually bring. And yeah, he's been he's been really really good while Knox's been out injured, and now Knox is back fit and um, was good when he came on. So. I suspect it's quite a lot easier to play nine inside Otario Black in this kind of form and Bowden Barrett, but you still got to do it, and they're doing it really well. Trick anything on the Blues for you? Uh, not particularly. No, I wasn't. Unfortunately, wasn't able to watch the um, the whole match as I was playing golf at the time. Um, but there are the few bits that I did notice from the highlights we've already mentioned: Bowden Barrett making a few uh, gaps, do carrying himself, but then. His speed of passing and, and Yuani to, to get those tip-ons uh, was obviously massively successful. So, yeah, nothing really more to add. Uh, I dread to think kind of what training must be like and what morale must be like with the Chiefs at the moment. It can't be a nice place to be with what that's... Was that six now? Six losses? Six in a row. They, it, it, it must be very, very... Quite a low place. And again, um, unfortunately, I think he did go off with an injury. But again, we're not talking about, we're not going to have Sam Kane talking about in the, t- in the play of the week. Don't get me wrong, he was a lot better than he has been. But again, mm. um, when you compare him to the other back rows that were out there today, even B- Boshier again outplayed him. Um, Sakulu outplayed him again. Um, so, yeah, but I think the, they were, as I said, the Chiefs were in it in, it, in the game. They, they looked good in some parts. They had, they've got some nice attacking structures when they look to go wide. But the key bit for me comes after 65 minutes where the Blues empty their bench. Like Big Carl comes on, Sam Knox on, Good Hugh, who was rotated in a, uh, rotated out, comes in. Great impact. Tira Black comes to 10. Barrett goes back to 15. Plummer comes on. They all come on within that sort of substitute bracket anyway. And then and then I was kind of like, this is them. They're going to now go in and secure the win. Um, just on the sort of the stats, like the Blues played 50% of the time off nine while the Chiefs, again, more spread out with 24% um, coming off 15, which again, sort of, again, highlights like how much Damian McKenzie has had to do in that team. Um, I think Gatland, we talked on Friday, Gatland got his selection wrong with Trask at 10. Like, we're taught, when, you want to, when you have like a New Zealand fly, fly half, like, yes, he's unfortunately playing in a losing team. So we're not going to give him as much attention as Atira Black has or um, Garn Bashup has at the at the, um, at the Hurricanes, sorry, and uh, Mitch Hunt at the Highlanders. But when Cruden came on at half time, the Chiefs, the tempo was up. The kit, like the I think Trask missed touch three times in the game, and you can't make the mistakes at that at a high level. If you get a penalty, you know the forwards are already in their heads going right. How can we get up there? And there was a couple of times where he did miss touch. And yeah, just, as you said, everything must be a bit low. But I, I was cheering for him at the end. I really wanted them. I really thought they were going to get over the line, that this is a much better performance. Again, they'd stay in the fight. They'd absorb the pressure. But again, crucial in decision-making. It seems to be that they're in that pattern and they're in that mindset where um, they've forgotten how to win. They, there's a few times now where they've been close to winning and they've played well but just still haven't managed to get over the line and I think that's something that's just a habit that they've uh, unfortunately fallen into um, Yeah, Harry, anything from you or I'll wrap this up? No, not, not really The Yeah, you can see there's no there's no thought that the Chiefs are not trying there's no thought that they're not good enough it's just not really working mm. Um, and the level of the teams that they're playing against each week. Like, there's no... One of the things that happens in Super Rugby, which really helps the New Zealand teams, is while they can struggle to beat each other, they can pretty reliably expect to have a really good performance against one of the weaker South African teams or the Australian teams. But when the the relentlessness... I know Jason Holland, the Hurricanes uh, coach talked about it this week, the relentlessness of this competition um, within New Zealand, that every single week is what would have been the hardest match of your month. But you've got you've got it this weekend, you had one last weekend, you've got one next weekend, it's just not stopping. And we're really getting towards the point where the end's still quite a long way away, but we've had, I think it's the sixth, seventh round? Sixth mm-hmm. round. 
these guys will be knackered. Yeah. The it it'll be very hard for the Chiefs to turn this around. I think um, maybe they'll hit one of the other one of the Hurricanes or the Blues on a bad day. But yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah, as I said, like I think um, that, as you said, like the, the attrition rate. We're seeing a lot more injuries coming into it now. Obviously, um, Lau Mape and. Alamano, we talked about Sam Kane took a nasty stinger, I think, in a, in a contact um, in that game. There was a few other injuries. Um, props were going off for tight pulled legs. Like, as I said, they are playing an intensely week in, week out. But I think what maybe from from what may, maybe we can sort of have an opinion on where, because we're outside of the New Zealand bubble and in that regard, that um, New Zealand, the be- they are playing the best rugby, like the best club rugby I've seen for a while. Like, I was like, we've had two quality, quality games again. And they were talking about, all right, we'll, we'll, next year we'll bring in a trans-Tasman thing with the Australians. And I was like, and we maybe not won't get into this now, but that can't be the way to go. New Zealand need to basically pump money into the Mitre 10 and make the Mitre 10 a competition that spread the players out. Like the, just the Crusaders, you can release some of your players to some of the other areas like Southland, and um, like Otago and places like that just to re- release the talent so then it's nicely spread because they've got a product there where it's week in, week out. D- don't get it wrong. They can't play Super Rugby Aotearoa like this every year because it's, it's quite short. Sh- it is going to be short, sharp with the attention span. They've got the opportunity to go longer, but the, the brutality of it is is really, really high on that. But as I say, I've, we, we can probably both all agree that the quality is, is, is definitely there. Um, moving across the Super Rugby AU and the competition that we thought maybe that was um, going to be really dropped off opposed to RTRO is really heating up, actually. It's really competitive over there. Uh, the Rebels taken a 24-10 uh, um, victory at uh, the SCG. Uh, Rebels were the far better side, if you've seen the game. They led 19-10 at the break, pretty comfortable. Um, the Tars, after 62 minutes, had made 120 tackles, which kind of really highlights how much the Rebels um, were on top. And they held up like three line-out malls where the Rebels really should have gone over, so it could have had a lot more. Um, Matt Tamur was quality for the Rebels. Shout out to Lawrence as well at nine, throwing his hand up again as the Australian nine debate continues. But Corin Betty was probably the pick of the Wallabies there on his 50th cap. Good, good meters. He took a nice try at the end where it's just tired Waratah's defence and takes a hand off against Newsom. Um, but it's quite a comfortable victory in the end for the Rebels, who are sort of back on track, I'd say. Yeah, no, it looks I I've, I've really only seen the stat line from this match, just um, having a look at it now. But some some very impressive numbers: 100, 175 tackles in total from the Waratahs. So that's that is a tough day. Um, Nineteen of them coming from Lockie Swinton. I know. You, uh, you're a you're a big fan of him, Johnny. Um, He's quality, really, really exciting player. Yeah, no, I think. Wow, so this looks like it was a tough game. Was it raining? Uh, no, the conditions were actually quite favourable. It was just yeah. the rebels had. We talked multiple things, and probably our key sort of meme on this podcast is possession wins you games. <laughs> like, but the rebels had all the possession. They were just better, and. That's rugby, like 24-10, that's a result. And it's nothing, the Waratahs weren't as good as they were, have been. They weren't as exciting in the back line. Um, probably dust themselves down, go again. But Rebels came out and they wanted the game more. Simple as that, really. Um, on Just on the lot, and then obviously the last game um, from Australia was the force. Against the Brumbies, Brumbies taken a really comfortable 24 0 win. They scored after one minute. It's a lovely, lovely try. One of the two tries of the weekend. Like Pete Samu, who was unbelievable at number eight for the Brumbies. Quality play. He's been at the Crusaders, so he's been around Super Rugby for a while, but he is unreal. Um, picks up from the back, good offload, couple of passes, finds the speed to Tom Wright, who sprints away and they go in the corner. Again, in the second half, they. Again, they turn it. It's a turnover in the in the Brumbies five meter line. Practically, they go wide again. It's another breakout from right, and he gives it to Simone, who goes over. It's again really, really exciting um, from the Brumbies. But again, they never came out of third gear. I was saying to Joe before the podcast. I just because I was out for the weekend, 
I just put this game on time six on Sky and watched it just like that. And I got, I just sat back and actually got a really good interpretation of the game because the Brumbies went left to right. The force hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered on the door. Don't have the quality to break the break a team like the Brumbies defence down when they've got the internationals in there, likes um, Scott Co. Slipper, um, Alalatoa organising that defensive line. You know, Kuandrani again. But again, the Brumbies never got out of third gear. They should have had more. Good result for the Brumbies in the end. Force will be a bit disappointed that they first time back in Perth couldn't get a win. Yeah, difficult. But again, this is another game that I've, I've only seen the stat line from, but there's... There's a serious level of effort being applied by the, these force players. Um, every every forward bar Loosehead and Hooker made more than 10 tackles and the entire back row made more than 15 tackles. They missed very few as a team. Um, good good carry numbers. They the, the force are doing really, really well for a sort of oh, scratch. Yeah. Together, some late late key additions who are having to get themselves up to speed very quickly. I think, I think they're doing really well, but this Brumbies team is very impressive. Yeah, but I, I completely agree with you. They are a lot more competitive um, in there, but it, it, I, I think it's the first game I felt that um, the, war, the, the force didn't have, they, they, when they really were really banging and banging and they really did try and get as much as they could. They had a great maul again, but it was just that little bit of quality. They just don't have, and that's unfortunately what they're probably going to finish up where they are in the league. But yeah, shout out to Laurie Fisher, who's the forwards coach at the Brumbies, who's been absolutely brilliant in mastermind that mall. Uh, the fourth try is a rolling mall, unstoppable. It was absolutely brilliant. And for those that uh, might be familiar with Fisher, who's the um, forwards coach at Gloucester, he wears like a cricket sun hat. Great big white okay. beard. Good lad. Um, but yeah, Brumbies in good position to go and take Super Rugby AU between them and the Reds, probably. In the end, that'd be a great yeah. next week. Just a brief note on Pete Samu. If anyone's not familiar with him and maybe more familiar with uh, the Premiership, he is very much Australia's Sam Simmons. Just outrageously fast for a back row. Um, so exciting to watch, but constant concerns that he's maybe not quite big enough for Test rugby. Um, but at club level, when when the wind's going in the right direction, he is absolutely amazing to watch. Yeah, as I say, it's exciting. And picking up on, on that, uh, we'll move on to sort of our team of the week and players of the week. Um, what we're going to do with team of the week is we won't go through it all. We're going to just, I'm going to post it up as a post after this uh, podcast is over. So you'll be able to interact with that. Uh, so we'll just go for our players of the week. And as I say, as Harry's just talked about there, uh, Pete Samu is my player of the week. Just unreal in that back line, like, picks off the base, like classic, like old school number eight, which the, the art of picking up from the base, maybe of going out where they want the backs on the ball all the time. So fast, got a brilliant offloading game. Like, yeah, he may not have had the size of some of the eights that have played for Australia in the past, but you know, he's, he reminds me of Radiki Salmo um, at the Reds where he, um, when I was in that Australia game in Bledisloe a few years ago for the 2015 World Cup, I think it is, or it might even be in 2015, where Samu runs 45 metres unopposed. Very, very exciting player. Um, just definitely to keep an eye out for him, so he's my player of the week. Yeah, great player, great player. Always always good fun to watch. I think mine would have to be Kurt Eklund in Blues, me picking the Blues shock move. Um, he, he did miss a couple of throws. Now, if I'm entirely honest, he probably wasn't the best player this week. Um, but having, having talked up James Parsons, I've been a bit worried when he um, got injured and Eklund having to come in and play the full 80 minutes, having not really played an awful amount of Super Rugby before Arteroa. He's been really, really good. Played 80 minutes three weeks in a row now. Um, pretty reliable. Hit that final line out at the end of the game to win it straight into Turpilotu's chest. No danger that the um, the Chiefs' uh, defensive lineup was going to get anywhere near it. Great, great try-saving tackle oh. uh, after, on Ale Marlo after Talia's... Cock-up. Funny, yeah, let's go with that. Um, 
So, yeah, I think Eklund has been really impressive um, in a position that the Blues have struggled with. And now, now they seem to have two, two really solid options there. Yeah, he was class. Really, really, really good again. I, I like him a lot, actually. Very plucky, like goes about his... Kind of reminds me of a little bit of um, Aka van der Merer at Sale. He just sort of plucks around. Not the best line-out thrower consistently, but very, very good around the park. And that try-saving tackle was unbelievable. How much ground he covers is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Tricky? No, no, no. Oh, go on. Go on, Aaron. Sorry. Not quite the carrying power of Akim van der Merwe, but um, yeah, in every other, every other regard, a, a great player. Uh, yeah, so my um, my player of the week, we've already spoken about him a little bit, you might have already guessed this, but it's Peter Munger Jensen. I just thought he was absolutely quality, especially from my point of view, I kind of sort of tend to focus on the back line and more specifically the centres, and he does exactly what I would always um, try to do, and it is like a, a, a almost a perfect performance from that 13 um, channel, the, from the lines that he hit. Every time he touched the ball, he was making metres and he was, he was breaking the gain line, and that it's so difficult to defend against the Crusaders and that's where Hurricanes were able to create the momentum and get a foothold in the game and then create spaces for their winners to score the tries. So I thought it was brilliant and especially as such a young guy coming into that team, Vince Arso is a fairly big name for them and has been in there a while and has done a job for a little while. For him to come in and perform so consistently well alongside La Mape, who is now going to be injured, He's going to then, um, he, hopefully this performance will kind of parachute him up and he'll um, trample him up and, and give him more of a starting berth in that team and more responsibility. So yeah, I just thought it was brilliant. Well, yeah, I was just um, briefly on Imago Jensen. Yeah, really, really impressive. I think um, other than Arso, the last, the last player to come through in that 13 jersey for Hurricanes, obviously Matt Proctor. Um, and we've seen how we've seen how good he is outside of the context of uh, New Zealand rugby when he's been playing for Northampton in the Premiership. Um, now, among Jensen's maybe not quite at that level yet. Uh, obviously, he's got a few years, yeah, got a few years on Proctor, but um, you can see you can see him doing really well in the Premiership team. A few more years of experience under his belt, um, talks well, car- carries well, tackles well. Um, kind of nice rounded skill set for a centre. Yeah, he's a very, very exciting out, outside centre. One to definitely watch in the future. Uh, he definitely gave him a highlight of the, of the week. Though, as I say, a Crusaders fan, um, I think when Crinton Strange gets a yellow card, he's just going, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> did enjoy that, yeah. Cameron catches him and he's like, um, quality, love it. Uh, you've got to go with that. So, yeah, nicely wraps up. Another quality weekend of rugby from the Southern Hemisphere. And we're now a week closer to the return of the Premiership. But as I say, we'll preview that um, when it come, when it when the time comes. Um, so for those that have been familiar with the podcast, we are doing a prediction of the Lions starting um, team from the first test for next year. At the moment, it's England plus a couple of Welshies. So hopefully by the end of today, we might be chucking in a couple of uh, other players. Um, but at the moment, we've got Mako at one, Jamie George at two, Carl Sinclair at three, Marrow at four, Alwyn Jones five, Courtney Law six, Justin Timperick seven, Billy Vidapola eight. Uh, we're going to look at nines and tens today. Let's start with nines. Anyone want to suggest anyone? And if it's Ben Youngs, I'm going to stop this podcast. <laughs> Yeah, there's, a, there's a few names, aren't there, that I'm not really sure who my pick is. There's a few in there that I think are probably around about a similar level at the moment. Um, and I think it's entirely going to depend on their form coming into it. Um, but obviously, the, 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 the ones that are up there for contention are the likes of Gareth Davis, um, Thomas Williams, I know, has been put forward by a few different coaches, people that have put their lines, team together that I've seen over the last week or so. Um, you know, there's a few in there. Who's it? Who's it? Um, Connor Murray, um, who is probably leaning towards, if I was to choose someone right now, I'd probably say uh, Murray uh, through just the experience that he's got. And um, he has been the Lions go to in previous tours. But there's a few in there, a few Welsh lads um, sticking their hands up. I don't think, I think Ben Youngs will get on the tour probably if um, if there's no more family casualties that like we unfortunately had in, in New Zealand. But just through experience more than anything, I don't think he's a Lions starter. Yeah, I think this this is a difficult one because it's very reliant on your uh, 10, i.e. 
you're probably not going to end up with Sexton, given how old he's going to be. And you, given, given that you'd like to pick these two as guys that you're playing to get your, you're picking these two as a pair, the scrum half and the fly half, you're picking as a pair. And you'd like them to really to be both from the same country. That seems to be the trend that Gatlin goes with. But then on the other hand, there is a, there is a real weakness in the established pairs of each country. There's no obvious, right, Murray and Sexton are the best 9, 10 in the world. Why would you not pick them? There's no, there's no Gareth Davies and Dan Bigger both playing really, really well. Because Davies, I don't think you could necessarily say that he's a lion scrum half, maybe off the bench, but he's mm. he's just not that same type of player. He's very much a win the game on your own scrum half. He's not bringing, he's not facilitating a world class team around him, which I think is almost where Ben Youngs does start to look a lot better. Because when Ben Youngs has an amazing team around him, I know obviously he does have his bad days, but there's never, I mean, well, really, my the sum, the sum of this is I think Thomas Williams is the best choice because he's a real a proper bring the best, bring the rest of your team into the into play, but also he's not known to be unreliable, and he has a bit of an X factor about him. Um, but yeah, this is this is one of the hardest positions to pick given the the base level of almost all of the scrum halves is pretty much the same mm. um, I was thinking about this and I was like right so who is South Africa going to go with and they're probably going to go with Faf obviously if he's fit uh, Kobesh Reinach uh, who's been brilliant for Northampton and uh, Herschel Yankees and I was like right we're going to fight fire with fire and and who is the only scrum half in the Northern Hemisphere that gets talked about the most from a game and that man is John Cooney the Ireland scrum half and I'm very, very passionate for him to be at nine because Conor Murray, he's passed, passed his best, set best now. Like, don't get me wrong, he's been brilliant for Ireland over the last few years. But we need to go to South Africa. We need to have X Factor. And he's going to become very important when I suggest my fly half option in a moment, um, which you might have guessed already. But John Cooney's very, very excited. If you've not seen any of the Ulster games, he basically single-handedly beat Clemont. Um, obviously, that's slightly erroneous because Ulta did play exceptionally well. But he, the X factor that he brought in that game this season has been absolutely fantastic. He's really, really exciting. He's got great pace. He's got a great passing game. He's the you might question his experience, but like throw him in against in in South Africa, you've got to faff the clerk. You've got to meet fire with fire in that regard. So yeah, Thomas Williams is a fantastic shout as well. But me, I'm very, very keen on John Cooney to, to be nine. And that sort of links nicely. Oh, is it, Harry wants to pop in before I do my. Just, just briefly say on John Cooney that yeah, I would, I'd love to be him in. I'd love for him to be in the, in the squad, um, and for him to be the one of the leaders of that midday midweek uh, team and do well in the, in the warm up matches. But you can't be a guy with so little test experience as your starting flight, starting scrum half for the Lions playing this South Africa team. He's a I'm, fantastic player, but so few, but so few tests. But that's maybe why, uh, where we might go better. Who was, the, Mate, who was the nine in the last one? Who was in, in South Africa? Or we got it a bit wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, South know? Africa. Yeah, last 2009, it was the scrum half. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I just think I don't know. Tom, it's for me. It's between Thomas Williams and John Cooney. I think John Cooney, as I say, I think I think he's absolutely fantastic, and I think the X factor you need, and yeah, the experience is experience. But the reason why he hasn't had experience is because Conor Murray's been ahead of him, and Conor Murray um, is getting into the point where he has lost a bit of speed. Yes, he gives you that game management. He's probably got one of the best box kicks in the world that we've seen, but. Box kicking is not what we need to beat New or South Africa. We need a, a little bit of quick thinking, a bit of excitement, um, because they're going to come at us and be quite attritional and quite brute force, and we're going to need someone that can take it and be a bit of X factor on that. Um, Just briefly, Mike Phillips was the uh, nine 
So Mike Phillips and Stephen Jones was the nine ten partnership. Oh god! In two thousand and nine. No wonder we lost. No, they're not bad. Oh, pretty yeah. sure Mike Phillips was the scrum half in Australia when we won, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Been a bit harsh to Mike Phillips. Um, but anyway, I, I will. I would suggest to partner John Cooney um, because as many fan sites have voted Owen Farrell as the best 12 in the world, um, Finn Russell should be the fly half for the Lions. <laughs> and for those that are not watching this on YouTube, Harry's has put his head in his hands. But yes, John Cooney and Finn Russell for me. The enigma that is Finn Russell. I'll tell you what, that would be exciting. That, that's one thing it would be. Enigma. Inconsistent is potentially another word that we might use to describe that. Uh, Finn Russell is amazing. We know how good of a player Finn Russell is. And it's certainly for Racing in, in the top 14, he has been awesome. But for me, part of it, and a large part of all of these selections are going to be, are they going to be good tourists? I'm not sure that Finn Russell is going to be a big, very good tourist. If he can't get on with his own countrymen and his own team, I don't think he's going to get on particularly well with people from his three closest rival countries. Uh, it's, a, it's a real shame. I'd love for him to be able to play for the Lions because he is a very, very good player. But I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, if I'm completely honest, I think if, we, if you were doing this before this year's Six Nations, you'd say Russell is your third choice fly half as the have fun in the warm-up games. Let's get Let's go. But... Like, there's abs. Imagine the fury in the SRU if Gatlin <laughs> picks Russell as one of two Scottish players. <laughs> one of one. There's Hogg, who, yeah, it's the second coming. Hogg's going. Yeah. Yeah. Rory Sutherland will be in, I reckon. Mm, probably, yeah, that's true. Their front row has been quite good recently. Yeah, he has been very good. But one of what's inevitably going to be quite a small Scottish party. The, a, guy, a guy who hates the SRU and <laughs> will take any mo opportunity to make them look bad or make them look even worse than they make themselves look. I I wouldn't be surprised if somebody told Gatland that he can't pick Russell. Yeah, I just I suspect he doesn't. I just think we want to fight fire again, fight fire with fire. We want the exciting players out there and. Finn Russell proved that he is he he does things that not a lot of other players don't necessarily do. And I do admit, like like if you it depends where you want to go. Like, do you want Farrell at ten or do you want Farrell at twelve? Against South Africa, ten. Yeah. In this Lions team, Owen Farrell at ten. Yeah, we've there's a lot of quality. You might run him over. There's a lot of quality at 12 and 13, and we'll obviously get onto them ne next week. Um, but yeah, as, as, a, as a very good tackling fly half, for one. But and you say fight fire with fire, but there has got to be a certain element of playing, sticking to your own guns and playing your own game. And I think certainly in that forward pack and in that back row, I'm, I'm all for having a, you know, a second row, another line out option is six. I think that's smart. Mm -hmm. But um, in how you play the game and 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 uh, being like you know exciting and off the cuff in the backline moves and things like that, I don't think that necessarily suits these players' games in Northern Hemisphere rugby as much. And I think that it's where we've been good, where England have been, have been good fairly recently, is just uh, being excellent in the running lines that we create and creating space through kind of planned moves and executing them perfectly rather than, you know, really mercurial play that you see from the likes of Faf de Klerk. So I think that's, obviously I've just kind of explained it uh, without actually saying it, but I think Farrell would be my 10 for that reason. Um, a bit of bulk in there in the defence, but also just he is an excellent player in there and we've got some strength in the centre. Oh yeah, yeah I think... Yeah, given the depth centres is like scrum half but in the other direction where you could pick loads of eight yeah. amazing centres across the four countries really every country has some really yeah. really good I just thought about Scotland lads, actually. actually yeah so I think next week will be a fun discussion as to what we yeah. what we want out of our um, centres 
But I think given that and given the quality of all players, both at 13 and even quite possibly 15, because Hogg's actually quite good at it, quite good at that. Um, you don't need Farrell at 12. You can play two proper centres and then Farrell at 10. Lovely. Yeah, I'm honestly, pretty agree. I, to be honest, I completely agree. I thought I'd throw uh, Finn Russell in there as a grenade and see what happened. I think he's definitely a talking point, isn't he? I, 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 I generally, though, I generally think if you needed someone to change the game, he is better to have on the bench than a, a bigger. Because if you're going to start, if you want a bigger to play, bigger starts. Because I don't think bigger has got the game in him to ch- go on in there and change a game and completely change the flow. They're, he's quite similar to Farrell, apart from probably the bigger thing is that he has his up and under and he chases the ball. Um, this is his main sort of differentiating point. But yeah, anyway. I don't think you change the game with your fly half change off the bench. I think it's too fundamental a system issue, um, too fundamental a system thing to change. Like there's there's a reason Cipriani's never the second choice fly half for England, um, or hasn't ever been. I think Russell would suffer. Russell will suffer from that uh, in this line selection. Um, I think you're more likely to change the game with Tuolangi off the bench or. Get a, a front row <laughs> bringing on Genj. Yeah, true. Um, one of the the fun hooker from Scotland. What's his name? Anyway, and then um, Furlong. Like, imagine that as your front row change coming on at fifty minutes. That's that is that's how you change the game. I don't think I don't think you're going to change the game with a completely different fly half who's going to just be at a completely different tempo mm. from everyone else. I think you want your nine and 10 to be more or less the same and then change things around that. But we'll see. Yeah. All right. Fair play. Um, I've, I've been talked to yeah. John Cooney and Finn Russell. Um, oh, Cooney. Cooney's on the plane for me. Uh, Cooney, on the plane, but is he starting? Cooney, the 20, Cooney 100% goes in the 23. I think... Mm. I think I really do. I've got a very soft spot for him. Um, so this is what we've got. So again, just to run it through, Mako, George, Sinclair, Marrow, Alwyn Jones, Courtney Laws, Justin Tipperick, Billy, Vinopola, Thomas Williams goes in uh, with John Cooney on the bench um, with Owen Farrell at 10. As I say, very, very exciting um, for us to discuss um, 12 and 13 next week as there's a lot out there. Um, let us know what you think about that. We might be chatting absolute rubbish, but yeah. It's just our opinion. Um, next week's game is then. So looking ahead to next week, we've got the Chiefs against the Crusaders. At the moment, I can only see that going one way. Uh, the Highlanders are back from their bye week against the Blues. Uh, and then over in Super Rugby AU, the Force against the Rebels. And probably the crunch game and with probably the opportunity to see where Super Rugby AU certainly is going is Brumbies versus the Reds up in Canberra. Uh, we'll see you on Friday for our preview pod where we're going to look through all the uh, weekend's games. And uh, yeah, stay in touch with our social media stuff on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, as I say, we'd like to hear from you what your thoughts are. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. See you next week. Yeah.